The short messages or microblogs of Twitter and other instant messaging technology, including SMS or text messages on mobile devices, are frequently discussed as new, as a dumbing down of language or as evidence that society is in linguistic decline. But there is another perspective. Rather than condensed versions of narrative or longer form language, Tweets and texts instead can form in many ways to the tradition of short-form poetry and poetics, which has shaped much of our use of language, especially in communicating quickly and publicly with wit and making observations about people, current events and everyday life in an instant. Tweets and texts are thus very much in the tradition of the epigram, a short, concise observation, often about a person or current situation, often using memorable figurative language that plays with and uses the complexity of language despite the brevity of form. While there is vision about the definition of an epigram, they are used widely, especially in poetry. Today, we find the epigram embedded in many other forms of writing, and used in many different ways. The origin of the epigram is generally attributed to the ancient Greeks, who wrote short poems as offering to the gods, and sometimes to show devotion to athletes. Celebrity worship is also not new, and especially on funerary monuments. These short poems were called epigrams from the Greek word epigramma, meaning to inscribe. According to Mikhail, An epigram must have the compression and conciseness of a real inscription and in proportion to the smallness of its bulk must be highly finished, evenly balanced, simple, lucid. That sounds a lot like the best, most creative text messages and tweets. Later, the form of the epigrams was adopted by the Romans. Epigrams have been especially associated with the work and wit of the Spanish-born poet Marshall, Marcus Valerius Martialis. Marshall took as his subject everyday Roman life. One of his books, Liber Spectacularum, was rather astutely published to celebrate the opening of the Colosseum, showing us that cross-promotion also has ancient precedence. Kerr, one of Marshall's translators, In fact, one of Marshall's many translators says, Life was his subject, not outworn mythologies or tragic bombast, and what a medley of detail that life presents. Fops, fortune hunters and dinner touters, dabblers and busybodies, orators and lawyers, schoolmasters, street hawkers, barbers, cobblers, jockeys, architects, auctioneers, Debtors, bores, quidnuncs, doctors, plagiarists, hypocritical philosophers, poisoners, jugglers and acrobats, the slave who has become a knight, or the knight without a qualification, personal peculiarities, the faults and vices of fashionable life. He describes a gown or a cup, a picture or a statue, a rich debauchee's banquet, the courses of a dinner or the produce of a farm, a greenhouse, a triumphal arch, a lion in the amphitheatre, a suburban or country villa, a private bath, a beautiful slave, the noises, duties and distractions of the town, its topography, the parties, theatres, public games, exercise grounds, the baths and the Saturnalia. Particularly fond of the obscene and the insulting, as a good popular writer, he knew that this would increase the readership of his work. And we can only imagine what his fertile mind would have made of, let alone done with, the technology we have available to us today. Reading Marshall's work, it often seems that it would be perfectly suited to a Twitter stream. Here's just a few examples. You chase, I flee. You flee, I chase. It's how I am. What you wish, I don't. Dindimus, what you don't, I wish. And here's another. You ask what I see in my farm, near Nomentum, Linus. What I see in it, Linus, is. From there, I can't see you.
and another. Rome praises, loves and quotes my little books. I'm there in every pocket, every hand. See them blush, turn white, stunned, yawn, disgusted. I like it. Now is when my poems give me delight. When his work was discovered by scholars during the Renaissance, it became popular. And why wouldn't it? It was earthy, often bawdy, witty and concise. His work is now acknowledged to have influenced literature from that time on. Recalling that Latin was then the language of literature, stylistically, Marshall's epigrams influenced a wide range of writers. Samuel Johnson, Coleridge, Goethe amongst them. Ben Johnson's own work, Epigrams, written after the style of Marshall, which he calls the ripest of his work, opens with an epigram addressed to the reader. Pray thee, take care that takes my book in hand to read it well, that is, to understand. Marshall's significant impact on European literature was both wide and enduring. Marshall had many English imitators, beginning with the poet Godfrey of Winchester in the 10th century, while from the early 13th century, Italian humanists rediscovered Marshall's verses, and throughout Europe, Marshall's epigrams became a model for much poetry. Between 1471 and 1993, there were at least 20 complete editions of his work and numerous collections of his selected verse in many languages. He had a major influence on his friend and contemporary Juvenal, while Juvenal's satirical style also influenced him. And Spanish historians and critics have credited Marshall, together with Seneca and Lucian, uh, as one of the founders of the Spanish literary tradition. In the 14th, 15th and 16th centuries, Marshall was read and translated in Italy, France and England. Throughout Elizabethan, Jacobean and Restoration periods, Marshall's influence peaked in England, where he had many translators and emulators amongst writers whose own work has not only stood the test of time, but has proven to be incredibly influential. We see epigrams clearly in the work of Shakespeare, notably in the sonnets, but also in the couplets that end each act. And so we can trace so much of what we understand today as poetics in the Western tradition to the epigrams of ancient Greece and Rome. But what of other cultures? Clearly the epigram has related forms um, elsewhere, the Japanese haiku is perhaps the best known. And like the 140 character of a tweet and early SMS messages, the haiku's very strict short form calls for creativity, imagination and linguistic dexterity. And as a literary form, it's also proven to be amongst the most popular. The hazal, a poetic short form popularised from the 6th century, is one of the principal forms of poetry in indo perso arabic cultures and shares many of the characteristics of the epigram. Similarly, Chinese classical poetry also shares many characteristics of the epigram, that is, a reliance on repetition, alliteration, the use of imagery and, above all, brevity. And so we find that the epigram and other forms of short, concise, poetic language have influenced and can be found in many literary forms. We are surrounded by epigrams in the form of headlines, advertising slogans, mission statements, greeting card messages, quotations, aphorisms, and so on. The epigram and its related forms in other cultures has been so influential because simply it works. The short, concise and clever language of the epigram is closely aligned um, to human conversation and oral communication. We see the epigram in the one-liner, the quip, the joke, a sarcastic observation, an aside, a smart-ass comment. Unlike longer stories, epigrammatic language is quickly recalled 
and can be related to others with a high degree of accuracy. Brevity of language has the advantage of being able to travel well and quickly because there's less detail to lose. The epigrammatic form also has the bonus of traversing space with relative ease, especially in comparison to longer form and more complex poems and other language. So, when we read clever, pithy use of language in the form of an SMS or tweet or email, it's not really something new, but rather technology enabling us to use a form of language for commentary and communication that's been around and been successful for a couple of thousand years. And perhaps it's the longer forms of writing that are an aberration. <laughs>